Welcome to Scottish Watches Podcast. We've got a returning guest with us, somebody that has been there since the very beginning of the podcast, someone that has helped us dramatically along the way, and someone that sells the world's greatest NATO straps. Do you know who we're talking about? Of course, it's Adrian Barker from Bark and Jack, and this is his first appearance on our video channel. We've had Jody, we've had a few of the other folks on there already, but the master of video is here to explain all, to tell me what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, and he has also been instrumental in helping us launch the video side of the podcast because it's all very well talking about wristwatches but if you can't see what we're talking about you're only getting half the story so adrian how are you have you recovered from dubai it feels quite bizarre you being so nice and friendly well, where, where's all this niceness coming from? It's because people can see my face. Uh, they can't see the daggers more, that I'm drawing to you. You know, <laughs> I've got to hide all that kind of stuff. It's all an internal monologue this time. Right, yeah. I see it. I see it. No, it's, it's nice. So how are things? Because obviously we caught up a little bit across in Dubai. I had been there for the previous Dubai Watch Week and this was your first trip. And you were a little bit apprehensive ahead of time. I remember you asking me, is it worth my time going across? And for me, for Dave... For Scottish watches, when we cover industry stuff, new releases, and things like that, it's massively beneficial. But you, you're you're almost like a documentary maker. Your films and your videos, they're more a passion project. They're more you explaining about what you love instead of just industry news. But I said it'd be worth your while, and you went across. So I suppose the first thing to ask is, how did you find it? Yeah, I was, I was apprehensive because um, when when I met with the by Watch Week team, they, they they sold it to me as we're we're a different sort of watch show. We're more friendly. We're more enthusiast oriented, and that feels like the plugs that everyone says about their watch show. Oh, we're putting this on for the enthusiasts, and we do things differently. And then you turn up, and it's actually exactly the same or worse than everything else that everyone else is doing. So I was really apprehensive about: is it actually different? Is it actually worthwhile? Because it's it's a big commitment going all the way over there. I, I mean, it's it from the outside, it looks it is all fancy. You get to stay in nice hotels, and they they fly out nicely. But it is a commitment big commitment of time it, it, it destroys productivity if it isn't worthwhile going out uh, so that was my concern but it, it, it I was blown away by how chilled every person you talked to who was there for business journalists and all that that atmosphere was so much more chilled and and happy compared to Watchers and Wonders, which is just a big graft. It's Watchers and Wonders. It's fun because you're getting hands on with brand new watches, um, and it, there's there's a buzz and excitement to to capture the new stuff. But it's also just hard work. Uh, whereas Dubai Watch Week just had this air of chill about it. It was, it was really nice, and I like the fact that it wasn't all suited and booted. You could just be you. If you wanted to rock up in shorts, uh, it, you were just as welcome as those who are walking around, the crazy guys who walk around in suits. Whereas at, at Watchers Wonders, if you wore shorts, you would most definitely stand out. Uh, and so there's there's an element of snootiness about it. Uh, but yeah, loved it. That was good fun. Did you like it? Yeah, I absolutely loved it. This was, as I say, the second time I'd been across and... You're right, Watches and Wonders is the the back-to-back. -back. It's the Wolf of Wall Street version. It's the American Psycho version where everybody is suited and booted. It's business first and foremost. And you're going from one presentation with a highly polished representative of a brand showing you this model, that model, this iteration, that colorway. Next, this strap, that strap. And then you're moved into the next one and the booths are very close together. Whereas Geneva Watch Days is a middle ground where it's a little bit more lackadaisical. You can float between appointments. It's the watchmakers and the brand creators and founders more than the sales reps. And Dubai Watch Week is just the exact polar opposite of Watches and Wonders. You go along and it doesn't matter if you're Adrian Barker or Ricky or Dave or Philippe Dufour or Roger Smith. You know, everybody's just walking around, bumping into each other, chatting shit and yeah, day one, I did turn up looking kind of suited and booted, although not quite. And by day three and four, it was cargo pants and shorts and trainers and all kinds of stuff because the weather does get to you at 32 degrees versus the three degrees or minus three that we get in Scotland. But I absolutely loved it. There was obviously some problems with the weather. Uh, we have mentioned before that they seed the clouds over there to make it rain. And it rained plenty on the second day. It kind of destroyed the city for a few hours. But props to the team at Dubai Watch Week. They had the place operational within a couple of hours. It was probably operational straight away, but they had safety measures. They wanted to double check everything. And you couldn't tell by later on in the day, you could not tell that there were cars up to the window with water because the streets turned into rivers. It's nuts. And it, it was really impressive there. Yeah, how, how quickly they, they got all the stuff together. Um, but the challenging part about the rain, the thing that I found challenging was 
when it was just hot, it was dry heat. It was, you felt hot, you could feel the sun cooking you, but kind of just, your sweat just evaporated. But as soon as it rained, the, the heat just stuck to you and I felt like it was really hard to, to keep going in that. I'm, I'm a bit of a, what's politically correct? I don't like the heat. Pansy? A pansy. <laughs> that, that's rude to pansies, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I don't like I don't like the heat, uh, especially when you can't escape from it. Uh, so that was that was a bit of a challenge. Uh, but yeah, it was good fun. I enjoyed it. I want to do it again? On the whole, it was good. And another good thing to talk about is probably the wrist check. But before we do that, we're going to tell you to check the show notes. If you click the link in the YouTube video, it will take you to our website, to a specific page dedicated to this episode of the show. There you'll find details of the watches, the bits and bobs we talk about, and links to amazing Christmas gift ideas from Adrian Barker. And we'll get to that later on. But next thing to do is the wrist checks, and you're the guest today, so you can tell us what you've got on the wrist. I've got my... Uh, get my face out of the way. IWC Mark 20 on, uh, on a Barker and Jack Nace, sorry, of course. Uh, but this this is... I've had this watch a while now, probably nearly a year. Um, I haven't made a video on it, and I keep getting battered by people saying, when are you going to make a video on it? And the problem is, when I buy watches, I'm... I'm I don't often buy the new shiny. I, I tend to take my time thinking about a watch. And so by the time I've thought about it, it's just old. And so we kind of want to focus on the new stuff. Um, I will make a video on this watch. Uh, but it's, it's, and it's something new will come out. Tudor will launch another limited edition Pelagos FXD or something like that. And that'll be the, the fun thing to talk about. What, what are you wearing? I can see what you're wearing. You're wearing a big boy watch. I have got on a watch that I wore in Dubai. So let me get a close up of it. Look, it's almost as if I planned this, isn't it? Oh, look at that. It turns out it could be this watch here that we launched just a couple of days ago. If you're watching this the day the video and the podcast came out, our limited edition Braveheart edition came out on St. Andrew's Day. And potentially there may be a few of them left. I'm not wearing this on the wrist because we're recording this ahead of time. I today instead... I'm wearing my Daytona. This is a watch I picked up last July and I'm very selective about when and where I wear it for obvious reasons and if you know who Paul Thorpe is you will understand exactly what I'm talking about but I feel safe wearing this in Dubai. I also kind of feel safe wearing it in Geneva although I have been warned off it but this is my Oysterfex laden Daytona and it is my favourite. I've actually not worn my Batman since I picked this one up a year ago uh, although it is very selective where I wear it and it usually lives in a safety deposit box in the heart of Glasgow for safekeeping. It was quite refreshing to be able to just wear a watch and, and not have to think, is this location safe? And just, I mean, and out in Dubai, uh, a, a precious metal Rolex is, is like a, a G-Shock over here. It's, it's, it's crazy, the, the level of watches. But it was just nice. It was refreshing. It was liberating um, in a very first world way of being able to wear a nice expensive watch and not have to worry about it. Well I'd seen a video on YouTube where somebody had left, and it could be fake, don't know, had left a protect 5711 Nautilus lying in Dubai, went away and got their lunch and came back and it was still sitting in the same place. Now that could have been faked but within the grounds of Dubai Watch Week definitely you would be safe. In actual fact they would probably chase after you to say that you'd left it behind because there were all kinds of things on display and I don't want to give the wrong impression that super expensive watches are common or garden and it's snooty in that way. It's not. People were wearing swatches and G-Shocks and Hamilton khakis and all kinds of things. And then somebody was wearing a Grubel Forze or an MBNF. And nobody gave a hoot. Nobody commented or said anything negative. In actual fact, I was stopped in the elevator going to, I think it was a Frederic Constant event one of the nights. And it was in the elevator. Me, Simona and a couple other people, uh, a guy and his girlfriend or his wife, and the person looked at my wrist and said, is that the new Christopher Ward? Is that the new one, the, the moon phase? And I thought, wow, somebody in Dubai has stopped me for wearing a Christopher Ward. But then again, it just goes to show that they are doing good things as well. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And and you, you're, you're right about, about, I think snootiness comes from people's attitude with their products. Like you, you can be you can be snooty with a Mont Blanc. You can be snooty with... Uh, a run of the mill Seamar. So I, th I think it's people's attitude towards the watch. Uh, where, whereas over there, it, 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 there was very much people were wearing their nice watches because it was an occasion to wear a nice watch. Like, like if you'd go, I've never been to a car meet, but I imagine if you go to a car meet, you'd you'd take your best version of that car if you've got multiples, 
because not to say you want to show it off, but you want to allow, you want to appreciate it. And you want other people to appreciate it as opposed to look how rich I am. It's look at this rare piece of this watch or whatever. So yeah. Yeah. I think solution just comes from, um, I, I remember my, my most, no, I, I, I should be negative. Let's keep, let's stay positive. Happy days. No, no. We like a bit of negativity because we'll get to the good stuff. This is the story <laughs> arc. So this is the negative second act. Hit us with it. Oh, no. It was just my one of my worst uh, customer experiences was uh, from, uh, it's probably shut down now, Mont Blanc in uh, Westfield in, in London, in West London. That I went in there and the guys were just so snooty, just just did not want to engage and did not want to talk about their products. Um, very much looked down at me as if I'd, I wasn't worthy of being there. Uh, uh, yet I was there to do a bit of a recce because I was interviewing their CEO a couple of hours later. Uh, so it's it's kind of it was silly for them to be snooty uh, for for any reason silly but for them to be snooty. But then in contrast, my best customer experience was from Patek, where I, I went in 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 hoodies, jeans, and and Timberlands, and outright said, "I'm not here to buy. I'm just here to have a snoop around." And then the guy spent about forty five minutes with me, walking around, showing me talking me through the, the watches that they had, uh, full well knowing that I wasn't going to buy anything. So I think snooty just comes from people's attitude, not necessarily their, their products. That was a bit of a rant. I would agree with that one. And I also like to reinforce the fact that one bad salesperson in a boutique that is not the company, because people give Rolex a hard time. And I like the rant. People say, oh, Rolex are terrible, they do this, they, they don't sell, they've got waiting lists, they sell through the back door. But Rolex don't do that. That is the boutique that is owned by A and other. It could be, in the past, Bucherer, it could be Watches of Switzerland, it could be Vempe. It's not Rolex, you know? And people seem to think the person that you get when you walk through the front door is the person that works for the brand, and it isn't. So people have to make that kind of separation. But I've never really had a bad experience. I sometimes play a game where I'll walk in and I'll have like maybe the Daytona on or something else and I'll have it covered up and I'll see if the experience changes as I'm speaking to the salesperson. And within Glasgow, thankfully, that generally doesn't happen. And sometimes I wear random offshoot watches that we get sent in that nobody has heard of. And thankfully, I just get treated the same way. But obviously, I've heard many stories from yourself and other people and listeners to the show saying that... If they turn up, as you say, jeans and t-shirt, then it's a completely different story. Yeah, yeah, it really annoys me. And I, I, I used to do that all the time when I was in. I used to work um, near Westfield, and they had a booker. They had watches Switzerland. Um, they had they had a few few uh, boutiques there, and I, I'd often wear shorts and t-shirt, and then go in, and and they would ignore until they saw the Kermit on the wrist, and then they'd come over and talk. And they go, oh, "No, f you. I was, you don't like swearing anymore, do you? You never like swearing." So do you. We can I'm not going to engage. I do what you do. I, I picked up from you that the whole, you don't bleep it, you just cut the word out. So people still hear the word in their heads, but YouTube doesn't yeah. spot it. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, I'm learning, boss. I listen to what you tell me. <laughs> I, I'm not like Dave, you know, I actually pay attention in <laughs> class. But yeah, it's been about, as I say, it's six months since we last caught up and it was in Scotland at an event with Zenith and we ended up in a quarry in Ayrshire. One of the days was fairly normal and the second day was a bit like Dubai. It was a watershed moment. But we had fun. We had a chat. We were waiting for a lift back home and we just sat there having breakfast, shooting the shit as we normally do. And then six months down the road, in a blink of an eye, here we are almost at Christmas in 2023, approaching 2024. But the reason you're here today is to catch up with you because I wanted to get your opinion on all the stuff that happened across in Dubai. I'm doing it with Dave. I'm doing it with Barbara. I'm going to do it with a few other people, a few of the listeners that we caught up with while we were there that came over to say hello. Curtis spent a bit of time with us as well. We got some recordings with him to go on. But as a new person, as a newbie to Dubai, as in the city, as in the event itself, what were your first impressions? What attracted you? What did you like? And what did you not like? Yes, yeah, this is quite a conflicting space as a uh, a liberal person who 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 thinks everyone should have an opportunity in life. It's challenging seeing how segregated people are in 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 Dubai. You very much have the wealthy, and then you very much have the the serving class. Um, but at the same time, everyone in the serving class had a big old smile, and they seemed happy. Whether that was fake or not, I don't know. And and that that level of luxury and being looked after. I can absolutely see that as being addictive, and and for someone to, from the outside to say, but that's not reality. Well, it it is. <laughs> that's Dubai reality. Um, but then on on the flip side, it's it, it's it's a challenge to see 
um, to see the the social uh, separation b- between that. Um, it, it was very interesting seeing how if you have a huge amount of money and you're able to start fresh, this is what a city would look like. Because it's not like Cambridge, which has hundreds and hundreds of years of history behind it and and a settlement area and things have grown from there. Or London, where things have grown from something. It's essentially Milton Keynes on speed. It's it's a brand new location that's being created uh, from nothing with a huge amount of money from behind it. So it's, it's very interesting. Um, <laughs> I thought when driving around, I'd, you'd see all these pictures of, of, of uh, the royalty. Uh, and, and, and roads being named after royalty. And it, in the moment, I thought, that's a bit weird. But then you think to London, and we've got statues of royalty. And we have, we have whole areas, districts named after royalty. So it's, it's just a, a different version of that. Um, but I, 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 thought it was, I thought it was fun. I, I, I liked how multicultural it was. I liked how, how open and safe it was, how epically clean. Um, but that being said, I, I feel like I didn't really get to explore that much because... We're stuck in the finance district. And I thought, as we're going out for like seven days, eight days, I thought, oh, cool, I'm going to be able to really explore. But no, you just work. <laughs> the whole time is hotel, watch show, hotel, watch show. <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of the way, uh, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, but I, I thought it was really cool, really interesting. I always like traveling. Um, it's, it's seeing different parts of the world. I had the same issues the first time around. I went across and I stayed within the bubble that was literally walking from the hotel, which wasn't that far, to the exhibition itself. And I didn't need to go anywhere else. It was only when I came back after the first visit, I realised that everything was there. You had a local shop, you had all the coffee places, you had the places to eat. And then at night time, if you wanted to, you could go back to the exhibition centre because that's where they would have the nighttime parties and the soirees. This time around, because I was taking Simona with me, And this would be one of our last kind of big opportunities to have a kind of holiday before we move house next year and all the finances get pumped into that. We did do a bit of exploring. And thanks to having Hind Siddiqui on the show, along with Barbara Palumbo, a few weeks prior to the event itself, saying, you need to check out this, you need to check out that, go and check out the old souks in the the different districts. We did that. And Simona loves to explore and absorb the culture of places. And at the start, going in and checking out all the clothing that was available, all the perfumes and the aftershaves and the gold. I mean, I've never seen gold shops like this in my life. It was incredible. At the start, it was awesome. By the end of it, she was absolutely bluttered, which is a Scottish term for knackered, which is another Scottish term for extremely tired and frustrated. Because no matter where you walked, somebody would grab you. Do you want to see this? Do you want to see that? Do you want to buy this? Do you want to buy that? And I got to a point about halfway through that journey where eventually I was just turning around to the salespeople saying, listen, just tell me the real price. Does it not get a bit tiring, constantly bartering all the time? Just just tell me the real price. You know, I'm more interested that way. People grabbing you outside the shops, that that sounds a bit like um, the Argyle Arcade in uh, in Glasgow. (laughs) Or if you stand in front of the shop window for... For three seconds. Yeah, but they weren't grabbing me to take the watch off my wrist. You know, they were dragging me to show me other watches. And I think my real problem was, and you'll understand this concept, I was the tourist. I had the camera around the neck. I had the Osmo pocket in the hand. And Simona just kept saying, hide that stuff, hide it. That's why people keep grabbing you, because nobody else... There was people walking left, right and centre. Nobody was getting grabbed. It was me. But I really enjoyed that, and it showed you a different side to things. And then the same night, it was the Saturday, we decided to go on the tour because we hadn't booked anything during the day. But it was that night that we caught up with Andrew from Watchfinder and uh, one of the gentlemen actually from Yulis Nardan and a couple of collectors. They'd hired a yacht and me and Simona got an invite to come along. So we went out. Edward from Moser was there. And we just, it was a very relaxed night, apart from (laughs) talking craziness about crazy watches. But it was a good difference from the show itself. And this was something I wanted to highlight because Dubai Watch Week, if you go there specifically for watches and you're hardcore into it, like me and you are, perfect. But if you're trying to convince a significant other there's more to do rather than timepieces, I wanted to experience that and be able to explain it because in two years' time, we'll be heading there again. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, I, I can imagine, yeah, if you aren't a watch geek, then you might get a bit tired. The other half might get a bit tired of the whole whole thing. But, um, I mean, Dubai is a massive uh, tourist destination. And the beach, although we were in a finance district, the beach was only 
20 minutes away. It wasn't it wasn't far, 20 minutes in an Uber. No, it was super easy to travel around. The one thing I did spot, though, when I was down at the waterfront was the amount of influencers. And they were just everywhere, to the point where security were saying, you can't get down here unless you're specifically going to one of the yachts and you can name the yacht you're going to. And then we turned up and there was all these supercars in a row. I thought it was a car show, it wasn't. It was one person's collection just parked. All these Lambos, it was insane. Um, I pulled out my very small digital camera. It wasn't the big Z9, it was the Nikon ZF, which is smaller. And even then, security were on me within about 10 seconds. Sorry, sir, we've been asked to stop anybody filming down here. So I just pulled my phone out and went for it anyway. Yeah, I, I love iPhones. They, they, they can fix so many little holes like that. But the, the money in Dubai is crazy. It, it, it is what you see on Instagram. It is that that, that craziness of, of obscene wealth. Um, I would often think of London. London is a very wealthy city, but, but nothing compared to Dubai. Next level. Heartily recommend any watch enthusiasts that is interested head across because the plane ticket to get from Scotland to there was £550 return, which is not insignificant. But considering the amount of travel that's involved, it was, I would say it was well worth it. And Simona enjoyed it. She enjoyed all the multicultural aspects. She didn't enjoy getting dragged around at silly o'clock in the morning to different watch things and not getting much sleep and not eating too much. But we'll put that to the side. Apart from that, it was great. And again, meeting up with different brands, creators, new brands that I didn't even know existed before we went and having the opportunity to catch up. Or walking through the thoroughfare, which is, I'm, I'm not going to do it the disservice as one of the Wodinky journalists did two years ago and calling it a tent. It's like a custom built marquee where all the brands are inside. And I was walking through and I heard a familiar voice and I turned to my right and Jean-Claude Biver was just sat there. And I wandered over and started chatting to him. And we talked for about 15 minutes. He was telling me about an accident he had and his memory loss. And I'm thinking, yeah, I kind of got that through long covid and you don't really get the opportunity to talk to Jean Claude Biver for ten or fifteen minutes anywhere else in the world. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 one of the fancy parts of of of, of many watch shows. But in, in particular, I think the air of the relaxed air of it of of Dubai Watch Week allows for those conversations to happen. It, it feels like people are uh, disarmed. Is that the right phrase? I feel like people just seem up up for talking. It was quite nice. Bumped into um, Tim Mosso, which was quite funny. Um, immediately went into Tim Mosso mode, <laughs> which was the funniest. It's, it's, it, w w when you meet people off, off the internet, you often think, oh, are you going to be the same person? And he was exactly the same as, as an online, uh, which is funny because sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they're different. That's something that people have asked me about you because we've caught up many, many times out with recordings, out with events, and people ask, what's Adrian really like? And I'm saying to him, it's exactly like he is online, maybe 10% more subdued. But I think that's everybody. When you're on a phone screen, because obviously you've taught me a lot to do with appearing on YouTube and instead of me holding the camera pointing out the way, having it pointing in the way for a change, you do have to amp up ever so slightly. But Tim also, two years ago when I met him, he saw that I was wearing the Arash Turbion 1. And he'd never seen one before. And he immediately went into a 60 second review on my <laughs> wrist. And I'm like, holy shit. That is cool. Yeah, well, when 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 you press record, I get this sudden. I think it's this excitement. I thought of something that I want to talk about, and I I I just genuinely get excited talking about it, and then that kind of comes out, and and maybe it's the fact I'm, I'm drinking coffee and got ADHD, so all of that together just just means that shit just goes crazy. But yeah, but but also you you you're you're also in presentation mode, just like it's it's still you. It's just like there's a different version of you when you're with your mate versus when you're with your grandma. It's it, it, it's still you. You're just presenting in a different way. Like when I talk on on camera, I, I try to reduce my swearing as much as possible. Whereas I have a foul mouth when when I'm in person. Um, be a bit more well behaved. I would agree with that as well. Well behaved <laughs> at the moment, yes. So over there. What brands did you like? What new stuff did you see that perhaps you didn't know about before or it grabbed your attention because it was there in front of you? The one thing that I noticed, uh, my, my, my favourite watch I think of 2023 is is a watch that was launched out there by Showpod called Strike One. It looked like a very unassuming watch and, and I like that about watches. Um, I, I, some people say I have a, a boring taste in watches but I like watches that look normal 
so to speak, but have something different about them. That's, that's why I like the Kermit, because it's it's just a standard Submariner with something a little bit different about it. Um, that's what I like about the Strike One. It's it's a normal dress looking watch, but it's got this little push in the crown, and it chimes every hour. So it has the the minute repeater chiming mechanism, but it only chimes on hour. But then that that raises a cre- a question for me around. I always fall in love with Chopard uh, at watch events. So Watch of Wonders, one of my favorite watches was the Alpine Eagle with, with the high high beat movement, um, the super high beat movement. But then outside of the watch events, I don't talk about Chopin. They, they, they just completely fall off the radar for me. And I, I kind of feel like that's sad for um, for watch brands who, who, who have legitimately great products. Like this this Chopin LUC is is really highly made. The, the finishing is absolutely beautiful. The design is beautiful. It's not a matter of some, some watch brands have high finishing and and all right designs and some watch brands have fantastic designs and and mediocre finishing and i feel like the this this show part is is just absolutely gorgeous um and it, it just feels a little i feel sad for show part that that not many people talk about them yeah they they do do stunning work but the same could be said for people like jlc that, that they fall off people's radars all the time they, they have they have some great products um and it was there was a conversation was being had at um, the MBNF launch just before Dubai Watch Week, where these journalists were talking about how it's their job to tell the story of the watch brands. And I kind of think, is it? Is it your job to do it, or is it the brand's job? Unless you're being paid to do it, then then it is your job. But then I guess it is our job. It is our job to, not job, but it's our desire to talk about the things that we find interesting. Um yeah, I don't know where I sit on that. Ed, Ed, do you find that with watch brands? Is there a watch brand that that you get excited by when you see them on the odd occasion at a watch event and then just completely forget about them? Or maybe it's my dyslexia that just allows me to forget. It's not. It's not you. Uh, I know what you mean. And I think it comes back to old school mentality of different watch brands. The older Swiss ones, and I'm going to throw Mont Blanc in here as well because they have got Minerva. An LUC Chopin is a very similar thing. It's almost like Toyota Lexus. And whenever they release something really cool at Watches and Wonders, flurry of activity, and then it calms down and you don't hear anything. It's almost as if the marketing machine goes back to sleep for the the other 11 months. Whereas different brands that maybe we're more accustomed to hearing from that have got sporadic releases throughout the year or they stoke the fires, they announce something, then it becomes available, then they promote it, then people start buying it, then people start wearing it. So it's always in the consciousness. But JLC again, fantastic watches, some of the best releases this year at Watches and Wonders, but nobody is talking about them for the rest of the year. They just, they don't. And and is, is that is that the brand's fault? Is that our fault? I, I did a video talking about how um, the... Uh, People, people often criticise me for only talking about Rolex, and and I probably and I only do that because that gets the views. And and I, I I switch it around and say no, I get the views because I talk about Rolex, and I talk about Rolex because I I like what they do. And so it's it's kind of this self fulfilling system. Um, and, and so naturally, those who talk about products that are are popular naturally rise to the top and have the biggest audience. Um, so so I don't know, I don't know what the question is, but it. There must be a system there. That, but then you get people like Studio Underdog. Richard, who, who, who runs Studio Underdog, comes from absolutely nothing and the world talks about him. So surely if he can do it, then Chopin can do it. Or JLC can do it. It, it makes no sense. So I'm, I'm blaming the watch friends. <laughs> and I think your other point there about is it our job to tell the story of the brands? It depends what we dictate our job to be. I see my role, because I created it myself, I wasn't employed by Hodinkee or QP or somebody like that. I talk about things that generally interest me with a slight opening for stuff that other people say they're interested in, because it's not all about me. But if I'm not genuinely passionate about the things I talk about, then it'll come across as fake. And if I spot a story, Studio Underdog's a great one. We brought Rich onto the podcast within a few months of him starting out before he really hit the headlines. And we've had Nicholas from Fears on. These are people at the beginning of their journey. Whereas it's it's more difficult, especially with the big brands. We've had Vacheron on a couple of times. We can't speak to the founder of Vacheron because he's been dead for a couple of hundred years. 
We can speak to the historian. We can speak to somebody in the marketing team. Even Accurist, a British brand that we had on the show a number of months ago, Oliver there, he couldn't tell us what it was like to, to build the company, to build the brand, because he's a young guy and he wasn't around when it first started. So it is difficult but if there is a story to tell or there's a particular cool thing about a watch from a brand, for instance, the Boulevard Accutron, then that's something I like to delve into a little bit more or bring somebody on who can tell the story far better than I can try and relay it. Yeah, and and I, I think that's... So I, I get a lot of my watch news from you guys. I, I, I don't really consume much watch content. I listen to the Grey NATO, listen to you guys. Ah, that's where the errors um, came from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm blaming you. If, if you don't talk about a show part, then, then I'm, I'm not going to be aware of what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I'd, yeah, it's it's just tricky. And I guess that's, a, that's, that's something. But then it also opens up something fun. Because, like for example, I, I didn't care what Tudor was doing at, at Dubai Watch Week. I see their stuff all the time. Uh, and so th th they aren't, and the same with Rolex. I, d I did go to see Rolex because they had some vintage pieces, which is quite interesting. But that's the fun part of, of watch fairs, isn't it? We, we get to see the stuff we don't normally see. There isn't a Chopard dealer, I don't think, in Glasgow. At least I haven't seen one. And it's unlikely for them to have something as brand new as as a, a Strike one around. Well, it's funny you mentioned Chopard because one of my favourite watches at the show was the one that changed the colour. And this took me back to my Max Power days when flip paint cars were all the rage. And you looked at it from one way and it was purple, you turned it and it turned green. And they had this beautiful watch, uh, I think it was an Alpine Eagle, a variation of such, and it was just mesmerising. And the lighting in booths is usually dog shit. And they nailed it, they got it right, and I really liked that one. Um, other, You asked me other brands that kind of popped out at me while I was walking around. There was a brand called Genus, and they have, I thought it was a serpent, but it is, it's a dragon that kind of works its way around. It's like a Fusé chain style arrangement, but I found out that is not how it works at all. But speaking to the people at that brand, Pamela in particular, that was an eye-opening experience and we recorded about 10, 15 minutes with her and we're hopefully going to do a full show because she was full of stories. It was like listening to the Gentas. So it was meeting these people that I didn't know about. It was a brand I didn't know about and it turned out on the last day of recording to just be this jewel that we picked out of the ground that was stunning. Did you did you see Remy Cools by any chance? It was just this, this single dude. I, I think you should get him on the show. I think it's it's right up your street, Remy Cools, and he's he's just one what one really young guy. Um, and he's he just had two watches. He had a tiny little podium in 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 the middle, just just one single stack, two watches on top. Um, and he's his website is just a contact sheet. There's there's nothing else on his website, and it's just a young guy making really sexy watches. Um, and it, it might be fun for you guys to, to have a chat with him, f figure out what, what he's doing. When I mentioned him to, um, you know, Marco from yeah, Swiss Watch Gang, um, he was like, oh, yeah, I know Remy Cools. So obviously people in that world know about him. But was, I mean, I, I play with Amiga and Tito. I don't play with these big, fancy, handmade doodars. I had not heard of them, but if he had a stand in the centre of Dubai Watch Week's indoor auditorium, then obviously he is somebody because they give space not to, this is something as well. They they don't give space to the brands they sell. They give some space, but they don't give all of it. They had brands in there they do not sell because the Siddiqui Holdings Group, they're like Patek, Rolex, super high end stuff. But they had lots of micro brands in there. They had the guys from Archer, they had Reservoir, Armenstrom, loads of independents that they don't actually cater for. So this was all done for the enthusiast. And something that actually I struck upon a couple of days ago when I was speaking with Simona about the event and recapping was this is in a country where English is not the native tongue. But all of the event was in English apart from maybe one or two of the panel talks. So they really do it for everybody else. That's such a good good point <laughs> that I hadn't thought about. <laughs> that you're right, yeah. It's and everything was in English. Um yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that as a standard arrogant brick just going abroad and expecting <laughs> everyone else to speak is speak my language. And if not, I just speak louder. <laughs> but the, the cool thing about Remy Cools was, was I, 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 I won't go on about him too much, but it, he he was just so humble about what he's doing. It, 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 he didn't expect anyone to know who he was, and, and it was just him, These this honestly, a tiny little... He, was, his podium was probably smaller than an A4 piece of paper, it, and, and it was just him to showcase his watches and, and he was just such a, a relaxed, humble guy to talk to, which um sometimes for watchmakers, um not all watchmakers are bad. 
<laughs> but sometimes they, they can they can have a bit of a an ego about them. But he was properly cool. Yeah, some of them drink their own Kool Aid just a little bit too much, or they believe their own PR team. Which thankfully, the ones that we deal with, <laughs> the ones we speak to, they're not like that. Um, just try to think of other people that we bumped into. We saw Konstantin Chaikin. He was there, as he always is, oh, trying cool. his best to avoid the limelight. He is somebody that would rather be at the workbench than have a camera shoved in his face, and he just looks the most unhappiest guy in the world whenever <laughs> somebody does that. Um, try to think who else. The guys from Urwork were there, the folks from Moser. I had a good chat with them about the new watch. There was a bit of an air about the whole only watch situation and a lot yeah. of people were showing watches and there was some underground murmurings that it was it was a tricky situation because the watches had been given to only watch for the auction but since the auction was not happening this year might happen in the future definitely not this year there was some legal issues about trying to get the watches back i don't know if you heard anything about that no no but that sounds very messy that sounds does a bit so we'll probably yeah. move on from that we'll talk about the good stuff so there we go there's a brand that you've mentioned what did you think of the panel talks did you manage to get to any of them did you experience that or were you just too busy looking at all the cool stuff outside i i, I popped into um way talking to max uh mbnf max uh and having a chat, the, the panel talks filled up very quickly, and and I am painfully unorganised, uh, and so I I just it was more of a matter of just sneaking in when it was fully booked as opposed to being able to to book in. Um, but I, I I do like the the, the panel talks felt like they were more more chit chatty. Mm, I don't really go to many at watches wonders either. Uh, but I thought it was cool. I, it, it's it's another touch. It's another aspect. And I like the fact you mentioned that um, there's brands at the event that aren't held by by uh, the Siddiqui family. It's uh, that kind of further proves the point that it is it is just celebrating watches. It totally is. I mean, I loved two years ago seeing the Audemars Piguet museum that they created specifically for the week. And it was showing the, the history, I think it was the offshore they were talking about. And this time around, they had all kinds of stuff. They had wandering hour complications built in massive size that you could actually see how all the different cogs and things interacted with each other. Bulgari had a great display of watches. Me and Dave mentioned on the show a week ago, you look at an Octo and you think, that's a very thin watch. Then you see the Octo Finissimo and you go, wow, that is extremely thin. Then they had their previous world record holding watches there, which looked like credit cards. And I just couldn't believe what it was like seeing these things in real life in front of me. They had all the GPHG winners in a display cabinet in the centre, plus the nominees. Um, one of the best things Simona liked was the Van Cleef and her pals palace i would call it it was it was oh, almost like a disneyland so cool. princess thing did you go in there yeah no i, I love that cliff I, I i tried a couple of times to go in and, and capture uh their stuff uh yeah I'm, I'm a huge fan it's 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 one of those things that is just so far from the normal stuff that i look at they describe this stuff as jewelry that tells time and that that perfectly uh, encompasses what they do because it, it the, the stuff on it's not watches it's it's far too pretty and 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 fancy to call it a watch it, it is art on your wrist uh, and I love their creativity and and I love uh, my favorite booth at Watch of the Wonders was theirs and my favorite booth this time was theirs yet they were so separate the the, the one at Watch of the Wonders was like a, a jungle a, a creative jungle um, and this time it was it was a, a Parisian um, kind of animated disney thing with, with all the was it monochrome monochromatic everything was black and white but it was just cool and amazing cocktails or mocktails went drinking um i'm good boy but yeah love their stuff big fan actually they've, they've got one of my favorite watches as well a little dial and the the it's, it's got these flowers that open up uh and you tell the time by I, I don't know how you tell the time the description says you tell the time by reading the flowers but it's just crazy mind-blowing stuff i remember the stuff they had at watches and wonders and i think it was a peacock and it kind of fanned open to tell the time like a kind of retrograde system and they had the watchmakers there at watches and wonders explaining all this stuff to me and i was just mesmerized that they immediately jumped up my estimation from i know dick about this to i'm quite interested <laughs> in what these guys are doing and 
It was more for Simona's sake that I did venture into this big plush building that looked from the outside just like a cube, like the Borg cube, but in Disney princess colours of blues and pink, spilling my background here. And we wandered in, and immediately it looked like you were walking into something in Disneyland. And it was all these silhouettes and windows, there was like a fairground attraction in the middle, there was postcards being handed out, there was even a set at the back, you could go and have your picture taken with all the cool surroundings, so they really thought it out. Even wandering over to Ublo, they had this same kind of experience in the back, where you could move certain things around and it would mix metals and stones and things like that together, and then they had an area over to the left of that, which I think was called the Collector's Forum or the Collector's Lounge, and you could go in there and see some amazing stuff from the likes of Rouge, where they had music boxes and singing birds. There was pretty much, and I know I say this quite a lot about things, but there was something for everybody there. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there is. And and I, I really enjoyed the the level of entertainment, the the, the activities that they had. Um, oh, who collaborates with Aston Martin? Gerard Perigo. Um, They had a little driving f1 driving simulator uh, which is pretty cool tudor had their their cycling stuff which when you're in dubai cycling in in that heat isn't a good idea uh, but it, it was cool seeing all these brands do stuff and allowing you to get hands on whereas that watch of wonders it's um i like watch of wonders i hope they invite me back but i'm just saying that <laughs> that they it's it's hard to get in unless you have um uh, an appointment and people like me are terrible at booking appointments so i appreciated how flexible by watch week was. You're right, and everything is so easily accessible, and it doesn't matter if you're Adrian, who runs one of the biggest YouTube channels in the world, or... I appreciate that's not true, but I appreciate that. It is true, it is true, right? we'll just go with it. Um, or somebody that's just coming along as a watch collector who's gone on to their website and registered, because we've met, we've met so many people wandered up. There was one of the gentlemen who's part of the writing team, Edward, and he just wandered up when we were at one of the Horology Forum talks and said, Hi, I'm Edward. I'm one of your writers. And it was the first time meeting him. And stuff like that was happening all the time. Another gentleman walked up to me and Dave and said, You're the reason that I'm here today. And it was just kind of, it takes you out the moment because you realise that people are travelling halfway around the world to look at these insignificant things that used to be able to tell the time. And now they're basically just artwork on the wrist. Yeah, that must be really nice. That, that is... It's it's not. Uh, I guess it is validation of of work, but it's it's more the fact that um, you make content. We make content and we throw it out there, and we, and we make it because we enjoy. We make we we enjoy the, the 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 subject, the topic, but we also enjoy mostly enjoy the editing part and, and the creation. And then you put it out there, and uh, often for me, my mind's like, cool, next one. Um, and it's it's not turning it out. It's just that that's how long it takes to make the content, and so it's it's not a matter of um, over analyzing what you've done uh, or the message that you're sharing, you, you think of something that you want to share and 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 you, and you put it out. But it's it's kind of cool to think, oh, someone someone actioned that. You you believed that this thing was good, and someone did it, and here it is, and and it is good. It's really cool, and it reminds me of various things in the past where maybe we've reviewed a watch, and we've had an email a month later from the brand saying. We suddenly sold a couple of this watch that we've not really sold much of in the past and we asked the people that bought them why and they said because they'd heard it on the podcast. So it is validation and I mean I just do this for fun. I was doing it long before it became my job, my career. It was a hobby for a number of years and I'm just thankful that I've managed to apply some of the things that I've picked up over my careers in publishing and journalism and photography and kind of rolled them into a little ball that turned into Scottish watches and people listen and people watch and they kind of like some of the stuff that we do. So long may it continue because I'm not bored. And this is now six to almost seven years that I've been playing with wristwatches. And every time I get an email, every time I get a knock at the door to say there's something to be collected, I'm just as excited as I was day one. And it doesn't matter if it's from a brand that's doing, as we did a couple of weeks ago there, the, the Spinnaker launch, which is 395 quid, free plug, or it could be something that's 395,000 quid. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me. I just appreciate everything. And in actual fact, because I knew I was going to Dubai and I wasn't scared of leaving my Rolex in the hotel room, which I would be scared anywhere else on the planet, I actually brought a selection of watches with me. And as I say, I had the Christopher Ward, the new moon phase. I had, oh, I can never pronounce the name, the Italian Mother of Pearl green watch that people remember. I had the Sega design, 
uh, Blue Planet Gilding Edition, and the Worn and Wound Laser Tag, which <laughs> one of the editors at Worn and Wound spotted on my wrist and popped in their Instagram stories. It didn't bother me. It didn't bother me the cost, the type, how many, if it was limited, if it was a production run model. I'm still as excited about all watches as I was seven years ago. And when I was working with cars, that wasn't the case. I kind of got immune to things quite quickly. But for some reason with watches, maybe it's an age thing. Maybe it's a post-COVID thing. I just love them. Yeah, I I'd, I'd, I'd put off um, starting. With, I'd, I had the idea for a YouTube channel years before actually doing it. And I kept putting it off because uh, I'd, I'd have like a notes thing in my in my phone. I'd make a, a list of videos that I could do. And I think, oh, I'm just going to run out of content. There's no point making a channel because I'll three videos in now, I've got nothing else to talk about. And now, what, seven years? Six, seven years in, and I've got a backlog of videos that need to be edited. It's, it's one of those things where it is actually, there's just, there's always stuff to talk about. There's always stuff. And and because the the watch world is so vast, both mechanically and from from a design point of view, uh, the, the history, um, the importance, the significance, um, it's, there's so many avenues to go down. It's, it's kind of, kind of limitless which is funny when people call themselves watch experts it's like well you, you can't really but you could be an expert in the history of rolex or you could be an expert in in the speed masters that went to space but you can't be a watch expert because it's, it's too deep <laughs> it's, it's crazy deep no you would have to cover 300 plus years of everything i was meeting a couple of watch gentlemen today who traveled up from england to see me and we're going to be producing a show on their brand because I needed to see the watch and I needed to speak to them in person to figure out how I was going to tell the story because the breadth and knowledge of the team behind this company and what they've done, not within watchmaking circles, but within other amazing circles, the people that they're involved with, it's incredible. And I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, although I'll tell you afterwards and people just have to listen to future episodes. But I was chatting to them about chronographs and they were talking about recording time at, oh God, it would have been racetracks a hundred years ago, using machines that looked like polygraph machines, and they would record one one thousandth of a second. That is a hundred years ago to the, the tolerances they could record time. And I was just like, holy shit. So yeah, you think you know about watches, you think you know about timekeeping and all the rest of it, you know nothing because there is so much to go through. And that is something that I learned very quickly, that if I ever get bored with what's out just now, I just have to look 20 years in the past when I wasn't involved in watches and knew nothing and be blown away by Harry Winston Opus collection and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And and it's it's I get so excited by um seeing watches that were used for a real purpose and 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 just keeping time. That 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 I love the idea of um time and and it, it was just a made up thing and then you have to turn it into this mechanical thing and then you have to think oh well we it's like when they built the first computer and now we have these tiny iPhones it's we have this mechanism that that records time right let's shrink it right down and then you mentioned earlier about um the, the two millimeter thick watch it's, it's crazy where where this stuff goes but uh, yeah I, I get really excited seeing uh, in the Argyle like hey there's there's I don't know what the place is called but it's pretty much the only vintage proper vintage watch shop uh, and they've got all of these World War II watches, and you think people just needed that stuff to do their job, and it's uh, and and racing. People needed these devices to do that. Now we've got computers that, or, or lasers that will record stuff to a different degree. But there's something um, I don't want to say it turns me on, but there's something satisfying when you think that there's just cogs inside, and they thought, right, these cars are moving this fast, and the gap between them is so little that we need this thing to be that accurate and to be able to display record and display time that shit is cool it definitely is and something that's equally as cool is a trip that we're planning that we should probably tell people more about because we're heading on our travels it's been four years maybe four years since we last went across and it was to visit jlc and we're heading across to iwc in a few weeks time yeah this is stressing me out because it's i have no idea what's going on I don't know. I, I know the dates, and also I need to be in London like the day after. So, um, but yeah, have you got your ticket yet? Have you got flights? Listen, listeners that are long term <laughs> listeners will remember the trip to JLC where you thought it was a day after, and it was actually the day before we were travelling. And I reminded you, and you said, "Oh shit, 
Someone's going to have to pick the kids up from school. I've got a more up-to-date version of that. I, I was at, in the hotel bar in Dubai Watch Week, and um, people were talking about, uh, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do this on Monday. And uh, Adrian, are you, you going to come along? No, no, my, my flight's Monday morning. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, four o'clock Monday morning. And they looked at me like, what? Why are you leaving Monday morning? Everyone's leaving Tuesday. I don't know. I, I, I had to come out early for MBNF, so maybe I'm leaving early. Don't know. And it just in the lift up, it just so thought, you may as well check your email. It's going to take three seconds. Check your email and see what time your flight is. Um, yeah, and my flight was on Tuesday morning, not Monday mornings. Never change. Never change, Adrian. Stay the, the gentleman that you are today. Well, I remember we bumped into each other on the way back. We were in the airport killing some time before our flight. And you caught me looking at some G-Shocks in one of the duty-free shops because they had all these cool colorways that I was not allowed to buy one of, unfortunately, that time. But no, it was, but it was a great experience going across there. I think we've kind of talked enough about Dubai Watch Week. And before we kind of round out the show, because we've only got a few minutes left, I'm going to ask the serious questions now that all the, the camera guys are now listening intently because they know what's about to happen. What's happening in the world of Adrian and video cameras? All right, well, I've, I've, I've got a... Um... A video guy, he's an editor, he's joining me, um, which should be quite fun. Uh, but I want to check out that that DJI Osmo um, 4, Pocket 4. Is it the 4 or 3? That's, no, that's, that's what I the do. one that comes out in a couple of years, <laughs> right. that's the 3. But right now I'm shooting on a Sony A7C, um, which is a, a shocking camera. I want to get rid of it and get uh, another A7 Mark IV because that's at home. And I need one that just sits here and stays here because that can plug straight into the computer as opposed to this that doesn't. This needs a little dongle, uh, which is annoying. As a matter of fact, it's got USB-C. Um, but yeah, camera wise, not not much is happening. I, I, I want to. I would like to get more Leica stuff, but uh, I kind of feel like I just need to use the stuff. One of the annoying things about ADHD, which I'm, I'm still learning, and I've, I've been diagnosed diagnosed with ADHD, and I'm still learning about it, is you just buy stuff. Um, and, and it, looking back every time I'd get stuck writing as I used to play guitar, every time I'd get stuck writing a song, I'd be like, ah, okay, maybe I need a new guitar. And I'd go buy a new guitar. And at one point I had 11 guitars or I'd go off and buy a new pedal. Um, and, and now I'd, I've, I've got lots of cameras and sometimes I just tell myself, just use what you have, just make it happen. And that's part of the fun of, of photography is, is problem solving. Okay. I may have ADHD. <laughs> because that sounds, <laughs> um, that's that's a familiar tale. Although I will back up my recent purchases to say that I have somehow caused some damage to my arm, which meant the Nikon Z9 that I have, my all singing, all dancing 8K raw camera, was far too heavy to carry around. Genuinely, I've been going to physio, and it's not for the reasons that you think, because I have a fiance. <laughs> but I decided to buy the Nikon Z. F, which is the wee thin vintage looking guy and throwing a really lightweight, not inexpensive, but lightweight 2.8 lens on it and it worked amazingly well and what I found was because the camera was much smaller and I could take it in and out of the, the bag far easier than the big one, I was taking a lot more pictures and obviously in Dubai there's lots of cool things to take photos of, there's scenery, yeah. there's this sun thing in the sky we don't see in Scotland, there was cool cars. <laughs> But I found I was taking a lot more pictures, and you're right, the little DJI Pocket Osmo 3 is incredible. It has got a one-inch sensor, which is similar to some of the Sony cameras, slightly smaller than APS-C, I think it's slightly larger than Micro Four Thirds, but it's got an f2.0 lens, and the gimbal system is designed for that head mount. So it produces amazing images, and obviously I will include some video clips in the YouTube, and you'll probably have seen a lot of them by the time you hear this part of it. I was really impressed. Uh, the way it worked, the way I was actually using them for interviews. I popped them up on little monopods and I could be set up and ready to rock within five minutes. Whereas with tripods and lights and light stands and microphones, it's just a pain in the arse. So instead of me going crazy and bringing all the shit that I did to Geneva Watch Days where I tried to record video podcasts versus this time around, it was just a breeze. It was a walk in the park and I could carry everything in one small bag on my back, even with the buggered shoulder and arm. Game changer. That's it. I've been watching the reviews. It looks amazing. I really want to check it out. Don't know if I need one. Turns out Amazon give you this thing called a 30 day money back guarantee. And if you don't like it, you get your money back. Or if you do like it, but you still want to return it and get your money back, 
That works as well. <laughs> nice. So yeah. I have been told. But something I have not been told about yet is all the Christmas goodies that you can get from Bark and Jack, dot shop and dot com. Mm. So do you want to tell us what is in store for the watch lovers out there that maybe want to get a gift for themselves or somebody else that's into watches? Oh, that's very kind of you. Appreciate that, man. So we, we, we've, we've got a whole load of uh, watch straps, leather, NATO. I'm allowed to say NATO? There's a whole... That's, we could do it. Have you done... Have you covered the whole NATO saga? Someone trademarking... I don't know about this. What's this? So there's, there's a guy in America who's trademarked the word NATO because in America you can trademark anything. In the UK, if, if something's out and if something's common, uh, like the word NATO or water, you can't trademark it. Um, and so because someone in America has trademarked the word NATO, um, he has been suing watch companies, watch strap companies around the world. Um, if you sell a watch strap called the NATO, a NATO strap, and it gets to America, he can sue you for copyright infringement. Now, although he can't actually back it up because it's across borders um, and it, he, it's out of his jurisdiction, uh, the problem is, is that Shopify, which 90% uh, of the platforms are based on, uses Stripe as their payment platform, which is an American company. And so what he does is he goes to Stripe, uh, well, she go, he goes to Shopify and says, this is copyright infringement, Shopify will, will um, ban your store, or, or sorry, they'll temporarily close your store and then the copyright infringement will be handed over to Stripe, which is an American company. So, therefore, it is in his jurisdiction. Um, and so that's why all of my watch traps are now called nylon, because um, you can get around this. You can still use call your watch traps NATO if you pay him a royalty. There's absolutely no way that I will um, be paying him a royalty. It's that, that, there's, there's so many layers. There, there's a WhatsApp group that I'm part of, which is, um, uh, a collection of pretty much all the strap companies um, uh, around the world because uh, everyone's trying to not have to pay this guy hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's 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 the story. I, I don't want to say too many bad things about him because he's, he's he's clearly a piece of work. Um, but that's why all my watch straps are now called, called nylon. I do get around the whole NATO thing, so SEO still works because on each... <laughs> Each of my listings, I talk about the history of the NATO strap. And because he can't copyright the history of a NATO strap, I'm not selling a NATO strap, I'm selling a nylon strap. But I also tell the history of a NATO strap on each page. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of drama. Uh, but thanks so much. Yeah, so uh, we, we've got NATO straps, we've got watch accessories, uh, all of which make fantastic uh, Christmas gifts. Uh, provided you order suit, that's, that's not to do any sales pressure, that's the simple logistics that when it gets close to Christmas, uh, shipping and postage is a nightmare um, but if you order soon then it should get there and if you're abroad then, then do, do keep in mind um, import duties because uh, Brexit and all of that fun which is not to get political but I, I think I think that'll be an interesting topic for you guys to, to investigate um, I'll give you some mm. some links because it's it's quite interesting especially how um, it is a kind of legitimate lawsuit because he does yeah I'll, I'll tell you offline <laughs> okay, okay. well that is a tale for another time it reminds yes. me of IBM allegedly could be a fake story I'll have to check snopes.com allegedly back in the day IBM tried to patent trademark or copyright every letter of the alphabet <laughs> oh my god could be a lot of pish, who knows, but there we go. And a great way to end the show with a link to Bark and Jack's shop where you can buy all kinds of trinkets and goodies for yourself or a significant other that may be interested and everybody loves what you sell because That's you've been doing it for man. so long, you've got so many admiring fans, we see so many pictures and watches transferred across the different straps and you're the number one name when it comes to aftermarket straps. So Appreciate what is the it. web address there? And we'll point people to it. Barkandjack.com, just barkandjack.com. And if you want to see examples of watches on different straps, just search Bark and Jack on Instagram. Um, and you'll get to Bark and at Bark and Jack. That's me. But you'll also see a whole lot of straps on watches. You want to check us out? We're on Instagram at Scottish Watches. Our website is scottishwatches.co.uk. That's where you can drop us an email if you want to let us know your thoughts, your criticisms, your comments, your feedback, plus negative. It doesn't matter. We read them out in the show no matter how disparaging they can be. But that is it. That is the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we'll catch you guys again soon.